recording this for like if anyone misses a class for whatever reason, they can just keep have them all recorded. So obviously don't say anything. You don't, you uh, wouldn't want on a record. Um, and we'll dive right in. So we're going to talk about graphing today. It's in one sense, a very large topic. In another sense, this should be review for everyone. So we'll maybe move slightly faster than we otherwise would. And graphing is simply a way to visually represent data. And it's a way to visually represent data of a numerical data of a certain form. You have two numbers. Let's give a concrete example. Say you're looking at a circle and you're interested in the radius of the circle and you're interested in the area of the circle. And the radius and the area are related. If you know what the radius is, you can find out what the area is. So you can make statements like, when, The radius is one inch. The area is, let's just round pi. The area is 3.14 square inches. So you have this relationship between numbers and you want to represent this relationship visually. Yeah. The way this works is we're going to give these quantities names and the standard names are X and Y. We'll call the radius X and the area Y. So this statement can be stated more compactly. When X equals one, Y equals three, Point fourteen, But this statement can be represented more compactly still as an ordered pair. When you have an X variable and a Y variable, and you want to re represent the relationship between them, that's traditionally done just by listing them. Here's the X value first, followed by the Y value. So here's one comma three point fourteen. And this data point called an ordered pair is very compact. But even so, if you have a lot of them and you just have a list of ordered pairs, that can be hard to parse. I mean, 
you might be doing a project where you have tens of thousands of data points. And if you just have a list of 50,000 pairs, it's hard to do much with that. What we want is a way of visually representing data quickly. And that's what graphing is. It's for this specific case where we have these ordered pairs, X comma Y. And it's a way of visually representing this data. We're going to be graphing on the so-called Cartesian phase. Graphing is such a fundamental part of math now, it can be hard to think that at some point someone had to invent it, but someone did. This is named after its inventor, Rene Descartes. Probably mispronouncing that, been a long time since high school French, but um, the sort of urban legend or the story is that this mathematician was lying sick in bed and he was watching a fly crawl across the ceiling and he asked himself how he could numerically represent the position of that fly. And this is what he came up with. He put two straight lines at a right angle to each other. And these are number lines. So here's one, here's two, here's three, and so on. Negative one, negative two, negative three and so on. And this horizontal line we call the x-axis. And then we have this vertical number line. Negative one, negative two, negative three, and so on. And that is called the y axis. And this is, as I say, a way to visually represent x, y data points. So let's look at this data point from the previous frame, one comma 3.14. This one is an X value. That 3.14 is a Y value. And the way this works is you go to the x-axis and you find the x value. So here's one. And you go to the y-axis and you find the y value. Here about is 3.14. And here is the point one comma three point fourteen. I don't know if this has 
any cultural reference in the uh, in this age of video games, but it's just like saying a battleship. You have your horizontal numbers and your vertical numbers, and if you give them both, it represents a point on the plane. And using the Cartesian plane, we can represent a lot of data very quickly. Like if we look at 10,000 radii and their corresponding areas, and we plotted them on the Cartesian plane, we'd get something that looked basically like a solid line, something like that. So it's a very good method, as I say, for compactly representing data. Now, the data that we're mostly going to be interested in representing, at least in this class, is going to be related by, via some kind of mathematical equation. Like this relationship, between the area of a circle and the radius of a circle is given by an equation. The area equals pi times the radius squared, where pi is approximately 3.14. So we're going to be very interested in representing equations graphically more than we are in representing these individual points. And in practice, a lot, I would say most graphing is going to be done using technology. I mean, there are some simple graphs that we'll learn to do by hand, but if you have an unfamiliar graph and you want to know what it looks like, you're probably just going to plug it into a computer or into a calculator and see what happens. And that requires a bit of caution but I'm going to next bring up the TI-84 calculator and we can get a little practice graphing on our calculator. Before I do that, does anybody have any questions about what's come already? Then let's see if I can do this. We want to share the calculator. Here we are. Wonderful. And that's just for reference, since we have the calculator up and we therefore can't see our whiteboard. Let's copy over there the equation we're looking at y equals pi x squared. So graphing is done using the y equals body. It is up here in the upper left, y equals. And once you get here, you're going to enter your equation. And once the classwork homework gets handed out, I'll be available if you have specific questions. How did you make your calculator do a square root? Questions like that. I don't think it's possible to just go over every symbol in front of the class. So for now, I'm just going to enter this. And if you have questions about how anything happens, we can tackle them one-on-one. -on -one. I will, I guess, 
make a few comments. We want the pi symbol. And the pi symbol is right here in blue above the power symbol. Our calculator is color coding. So you see this blue button up here. If you press this blue button and then press the caret button, you'll get the symbol in blue above the caret. For our variable, there's a variable button right here. And you actually have to be careful with this because your calculator also has all of these letters in green. And so the temptation might be to think you need an X, here's X down here, but you'll get an error message if you do that. You need that button to create the variable symbol. And then we need a square, here's a square button, Alternatively, we could press the power button and then press two. Let's do this in as few keystrokes as possible. And once you've typed it in, you press the graph button and there you go. A beautifully created graph. I'm going to talk a little more about graphing on your calculator later, this class period. Like I have things to say about changing the windows and stuff like that. But I want now to go back to the whiteboard because there's something I want to say about this graph. There's, I think, an important point. So if I can figure this out, new share, I want to go back to the whiteboard. Question. And when I put it in, it says error. Or let me take a look. Because I pressed that button, right? Yeah. So for some reason, you have statistics spotting turned on. You see plot one is highlighted. Oh, okay. And it's because there isn't any statistical data in your calculator. It's it's giving you this error. We'll highlight it, turn it off with the enter key. Let's get rid of that too. And now if you press graph, your window's a little wonky, but I'll get to the, so which is why you're not seeing anything, oh. but I'll get to the window in a moment. So the point I wanted to make is that I love technology. I love graphing technology. It does need to be tempered with some common sense on the part of the user. Here, making allowances for my shoddy penmanship is the graph that we just generated. This is y equals pi x squared. And x and y both have concrete real world meanings. X is the radius of the circle. Y is the area of the circle. And if you bear those real world meanings in mind, there's something very strange about this graph. Because here, for example, might be the point negative one, three, 
0.14. So when X is negative one, Y is 3.14. But X is our radius and the statement that I just made when the radius is negative one inches, the area is 3.14 square inches. I mean, that's clearly a meaning this statement. A circle cannot have a negative radius. So there are parts of this graph that we just created using our calculator that are completely nonsensical. In fact, everything over here where the radius is negative is meaningless. The only part of this graph that means anything in a <coughs> real world sense, what's up? The only part of this graph that has any real world meaning is the part of the graph where the radius is positive. And your calculator, for all of its virtues, is not capable of saying, okay, X is the radius, the radius is positive, I'll only draw the part of the graph where X is positive. That's up to you, the user of the calculator, <laughs> to recognize for yourself. So technology does have to be tempered with some common sense. And actually this exact situation comes up often enough, bless you, that I want to give a definition related to it, which is the quadrants. You'll notice that when we draw those axes, the x-axis and the y-axis, it cuts the graph into four pieces. There's a piece up here, a piece here, a piece here, a piece here. If this were a trigonometry class, we'd be really interested in this. As it is, I'm really only interested in that upper right piece. Although for the record, the quadrants for whatever reason go counterclockwise. So those are the four quadrants. But as I say, I really only have anything to say about the first quadrant. Because quadrant one is where X and why are both positive. And it's the only quadrant where X and Y are both positive. So because of this, many real world graphs only make sense in quadrant 
one. Just like we saw with the radius and the area, you know, if you are looking at time or distance or length or height or weight, there are all of these quantities that we measure and do mathematics with that have to be positive. And if everything you're working with is positive, that means you're stuck up here. And again, your calculator is not going to recognize that you know the real world meaning behind X and Y. That's something you have to bring to the table. And I say many. Not all, you know, temperature can be negative, profit can be negative, if you're losing money. There are plenty of real world situations where X and Y can be negative and you're not stuck in this first quadrant, but it is a very common situation to be. I have more to say about graphing on the calculator. Does anybody have any questions before I bring us back to that? Then. Your calculator will by default have this viewing window from negative 10 to positive 10, and again from negative 10 to positive 10. If they're not seeing this, then at some point you or someone else change that viewing window. Let's start maybe if you're following along and you're not seeing this, let's fix that. Let's press this zoom button up here. And let's press this down key until standard is highlighted. And let's press enter. And now you should be seeing this viewing, this picture. Is there anyone who's following along, who's seeing something different? Now, you see. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I went, I went to Zoom. Went down to zoom standard and that fixed that. Thank you. Syntax something. Let's go to. Okay, yeah, you've got pi x squared, and then you see this entire thing is for some reason. Yeah. So let's press, I think, the delete key should take care of that. Let's go to, yeah, or must have at some point pressed this button. It thinks there should be a power here, but there isn't. We press the delete key. Let's also, by the way, turn statistical plotting off. And that I think should take care of it. So suppose you want to see a different part of the graph. Like currently a lot of this graph is invisible because this gets above 10 very quickly. So maybe we want to that y be bigger than 10. 
maybe we want to that by go up to a hundred. Well, you can manually mess around with your window by pressing the window key. And you see, as I say, by default, it's from negative 10 to positive 10, the X's and the Y's. If we scroll down to Y max, we want to go maybe up to a hundred. We can press a hundred. And now when we press graph, you see the viewing window has been adjusted. Um, it's quite common in real world situations to have to adjust the viewing window because there's no reason real world data should be stuck between negative 10 and 10. Like when I give you the work problem, problem 3C is the velocity of a drag racer. And I mean, a drag racer gets above 10 miles per hour almost instantly. So if you don't adjust the graphing window for that problem, you're not going to see anything. So that's often a matter of trial and error. I've never, there are these zoom options like it down here, zoom fit is supposed to kind of figure out what good windows will be and apply those automatically. As I say, I've never had any luck with that. I always just end up messing around in the window. It can be a little tedious, but I don't see how it can really be avoided. As I say, if you want at any point to go back to the default viewing window, that is the one command that I commonly use in Zoom. You scroll down to Zoom standard. That will bring you back to your negative 10 to 10 Zoom. One last thing I want to talk about in terms of graphing on your calculator. is fractions because this gives students more grief than almost anything else relating to graphing and probably is the cause of about nine tenths of the mistakes students make when they're trying to generate a graph. Say you're trying to graph why equals 2x squared plus 1 divided by x minus 2. So the thing you need to know about your calculator is that your calculator group to this the follows the order of operation. This. If you go to y equals and you type 2x squared plus 1 divided by x minus 2, your calculator is going to look at this and it's going to say, okay, this division should be what happens. Well, first it will square this, but then it will say, okay, we have one, we have division, this will happen before this addition and before this subtraction. 
action. And that's not what we want to happen. We want the calculator to first do this addition, then do this subtraction, and this division should be the very last thing the calculator does. And uh, one simple trick to always get around these is to just always stick the numerator and the denominator inside parentheses, the P in pen. The calculator will then do what you're trying to actually do. Compare. There's the graph without any parentheses. Here's the graph with. parentheses. And you will notice the ones in green, the others in blue, they're totally different from each other. So it's really important to do this. Whenever you're working with parentheses or div well, I should say, whenever you're working with fractions or with division, because your calculator will always follow the order of events. And if you don't have those parentheses, that's almost certainly not what you actually want it to do. As far as presenting material, that's Question. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where the left bracket is on the TI 80 on the Texas Instruments. Uh, are the parentheses not both here? I don't believe so. Okay, I don't. Yeah, it's it's kind of you it's the paint is worn, so oh. it doesn't look like it. Oh, okay, sorry. No problem. So I think you probably won't do this in 10 minutes, which means that you'll take it home and do it there, but you can get started with me here and I can answer any questions you have. Lock these down, and you can distribute them. Now, sort of circulate. You can. Thank you. You can ask me if you have questions, just grab me as I walk by or raise your hand. As I say, if you have, if you have specific questions, how do 